Okay, um, so it's now 4.10, so shall we start? Yep. Everybody, yep. So hi everybody, um, my name's uh, Professor Kate Holland of the um, University of Toronto Slavic Department. Um, and here we are killing two birds with one stone today. Um, it's the first Slavic Department seminar of the year for um, those of us in Toronto. Um, and it's the second um, Dostoevsky Bicentennial uh, uh, Lecture um, for the North American Dostoevsky Society. The department was kind enough to uh, let the Dostoevsky Society piggyback onto it as part of our lecture series, uh, which is leading into uh, 2021, which is the bicentenary of Dostoevsky's birth. Um, so all of the lectures in the series are um, uh, hosted by a different Slavic department in North America and also one in Britain and um, uh, feature different scholars um, from uh, across the English speaking world. So um, we already had um, one lecture um, at Harvard um, given by Dr. Jonathan Payne of Oxford. Um, and then in the spring, there are going to be talks by Dr. Barbara Henry, hosted by UBC, and then another by Dr. Greta Matsnagor, uh, hosted by Bristol University. And today we're very lucky to have with us um, Dr. Catherine Bowers, who's an associate professor in the Department of Central, Eastern and Northern European Studies at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Um, and um, Dr. Bowers uh, did her PhD in Slavic languages and literatures at uh, Northwestern University. And um, she has co-edited four volumes. Um, the first, which is Russian Writers and the Fin de Siècle, The Twilight of Realism from 2015. Um, the second is Information and Empire, Mechanisms of Communication in Russia, uh, 1600 to 1850, and that's from 2017. Um, the third is a Dostoevsky Companion, uh, Texts and Contexts um, from 2018, co-edited uh, with me as well. Um, and the same, um, Dostoevsky at 200, the novel in modernity, which she and I have co both co-edited, which will be uh, forthcoming in 2021 from University of Toronto Press. Um, she's also published articles in the Modern Language Review, in Slavic Review, Gothic Studies, Canadian Slavonic Papers, um, and so on. Um, she's the co-PI uh, um, in a Shirk-funded digital Dostoevsky project, which is also she and I together are, um, are running, uh, which, will, which is a digital humanities approach to, uh, to Dostoevsky's novels. Um, she's vice president of the North American Dostoevsky Society, and she edits our blog, uh, the bloggers Karamazov, um, which um, I will in a minute post in the chat um, so you can take a look. Um, she is, um, her, she's written her, her first monograph, which is called Writing Fear, Russian Realism and the Gothic, which is expected um, from the University of Toronto Press in 2021. And her talk today, um, which is entitled Dostoevsky's Gothic Novel, Writing Fear in the Idiot, um, is what she's going to deliver today. Just one uh, I forgot to, um, to mention in the, um, in the preamble, um, that if you could all, it seems like everybody is already muted, uh, which is great. Um, she's going to take questions afterwards, and in the question period, which I will moderate, um, you can either post your question into the chat, or else um, you can paste, paste in the chat question, and, and we'll call on you to ask the question yourself to, to uh, Catherine Bowers. Um, so I'll stop there and let her begin her talk. Thanks. So hi all, um, thank you all for coming. It is my great pleasure to speak to you today. Um, and this is a chapter from my forthcoming book manuscript. So um, I haven't, I had originally thought that I was going to share today a talk with you that I have given before, but this is something that I have not shared before. So it is brand new for all of us. Um, so this is Dostoevsky's Gothic novel, Writing Fear in the Idiot. Um, and I should say also that my quotes, uh, such as they are, will be in both English and Russian on the slides or in Russian only on the slides if I'm reading them out. Um, near the end of part two of Dostoevsky's 1869 novel, The Idiot, General Yapanchin seemingly spontaneously remarks this. Um, yes, yes, but I'm afraid after all. I don't understand what of, but I'm afraid. It's as though there's something darting about in the air like a bat. Some trouble is hovering and I'm afraid, afraid. But what is the source of this fear? 
The episode provides few clues. The general describes his fears for other characters. He describes a general dread of the future, but the source of the fear that is so palpable it darts around through the air like a bat is never articulated. Fear is a significant actor in The Idiot. It underpins the novel's narrative, it motivates the characters, and it pursues the reader, who at times turns the novel, novel's pages filled with terror for the characters who, whose lives play out on them. I contend that this fear emerges from the novel's significant engagement with Gothic narrative force, that is, with the devices, tropes, and plot elements familiar to readers from the Gothic genre, which was popular reading in Western Europe in the late 18th and early 19th centuries and beyond. In his posthumous study of the Gothic novel's inception and reception in Russia, Vadim Vatsoro states early on that, quote, the Gothic novel is a cohesive and well-structured system, end quote. By contrast, The Idiot is regarded as one of Dostoevsky's messiest. The novel's plan was thrown out multiple times. It was already being serialized when Dostoevsky shifted gears and as a result, in part two, some characters who seem like they will play a leading role are marginalized while others become more prominent in the text. There are gaps in the plot and several plot threads have no resolution. The seams of Dostoevsky's creative process are on display throughout the novel, yet, as I will demonstrate, reading The Idiot as a Gothic novel imbues the work with structure and cohesion. Dostoevsky's Gothic novel demonstrates the power of Gothic realism, the intersection of Gothic and realist poetics within the form of the novel. In this talk, I will argue that Dostoevsky adopts a Gothic master plot in The Idiot, building on the Gothic poetics that had already begun to shape realist aesthetics in the preceding decades. In addition to an overarching Gothic narrative force, the novel includes many other Gothic structural elements, such as a Gothic narrative voice and a series of linked Gothic narrative arcs. The Idiot showcases Dostoevsky's use of Gothic poetics to address the philosophical questions foundational for his writing. The Gothic's appearance in The Idiot is not surprising. Dostoevsky himself confesses to an early love of Gothic novels in Winter Notes on Summer Impressions. Here, uh, he writes, quote, I used to spend the long winter hours before bed listening, for I could not yet read, agape with ecstasy and terror, as my parents read aloud to me from the novels of Anne Radcliffe. Then I would rave deliriously about them in my sleep, end quote. I give you this quote because it shows that Dostoevsky was a Gothic novel enthusiast from an early age, and because it provides a fairly good description of Gothic novels effect on the reader. Gothic is a mode of writing that dwells on the macabre, the terrifying and the gloomy. In my definition, Gothic works meet, works meet three criteria. First, they revolve around the solution of a mystery. This mystery solution, constantly anticipated and deferred, spurs both reader and Gothic heroine or hero onward. The reader keeps turning the pages, filled, like Dostoevsky, with ecstasy and terror, dreading and yet looking forward to the anticipated horrors. The heroine, similarly, often imprisoned by a nefarious guardian in a gloomy castle, opens door after door to discover the castle's secrets, in spite of the constant expectation of stumbling upon something dreadful. Secondly, in addition to mystery, the novel's plots revolve around some broken taboo or transgression, sometimes the source of the mystery, other times predominantly lending atmosphere. Finally, the Gothic is preoccupied with the exploration of psychologies, such as fear, anxiety, and dread, both in depicting the way these psychologies manifest within the work and in evoking them for the, from the reader. These novels are intended to spark readers' imaginations and produce a temporary but strong reaction in them as they do in Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky's Gothic aesthetic comes in large part from the British Gothic fiction that he read and loved as a child, but also has its roots in his fondness for Balzac and Dickens, as well as his genealogical debt to Gogol. This Gothic influence has long been discussed by scholars from Leonid Grossman's influential study on low genres in Dostoevsky from the 1920s to more recent publications such as Robin Foyer Miller's comparative study of Brothers Karamazov and Melmoth the Wanderer. Although Dostoevsky was not writing conventional Gothic novels, Gothic elements do run throughout Dostoevsky's works from his earliest Petersburg tales to his final novel, Brothers Karamazov. The Idiot, however, holds a special Gothic place in this oeuvre as Miller underscores when she identifies a Gothic voice that, quote, employs techniques of arbitrary disclosure and heightened terror, end quote, among the novel's four narrative voices. 
Thanks in large part to this narrative voice, a specifically Gothic sensibility saturates the novel. Gothic motifs with violent, anxious, or fearful psychologies, reminiscent of those from Anne Radcliffe, Matthew Lewis, or Charles Maturin, lend terrifying atmosphere to the characters' interactions. These strands are bound by a Gothic masterplot, which drives the novel's narrative. Narrative arcs, such as the fall of a noble house, the quasi-incestuous seduction of an underage ward by her guardian, and the uncanny figure of the idiot who unconsciously causes violence when he tries to do good underlie the main action. Similarly, Gothic influence is seen in the novel's leitmotifs, such as the many instances of torture, anxiety accompanying sublime transfiguration, and the constant discussions of violent death. Indeed, the Gothic-inspired narrative structure of the idiot builds to such a pitch that the reader is hardly surprised when, in one of the novel's final scenes, Mushkin and Rogozhin spend the night with Nastasya Filipovna's corpse. It seems easy to simply compare the idiot's various apparent traits to the qualities that make up a Gothic novel, note that all of them are met and label Dostoevsky's novel Gothic. However, I want to demonstrate here that a Gothic structure pervades the novel on a much deeper narrative level, prompting individual characters' actions and enabling interactivity between reader and text. Which brings us to part one. From the novel's first paragraph, the reader enters a world of mystery. A train approaches Petersburg in the dim morning light and the reader learns that all the passengers have pale yellow faces that match the damp fog surrounding the train, blocking the light from permeating the, ca permeating the car. We meet Bergwazhin and Mushkin and from the start, the narrator links both together and establishes them as opposites. Mushkin's fair complexion, light hair and placid blue eyes counter Rogozhin's deathly pallor, dark hair, and fiery gray eyes. Similarly, Mushkin appears robustly healthy, although his sunken cheeks and something in his eyes suggest lingering illness, whereas Rogozhin's mocking malicious smile belies the inner torment suggested by his sickly appearance and exhausted demeanor. From this first meeting, Mushkin and Rogozhin enter into a binary opposition that propels the novel's narrative. A cycle of mutual torment binds them, revolving around their shared fascination with Nastasia Filipovna. Mushkin's compassionate, idealistic attitudes and actions unintentionally provoke Rogozhin to violent behavior against himself and others. Rogozhin similarly acts as a catalyst for Mushkin's extreme self-sacrificing behavior. In this sense, Mushkin's inability to break out of this struggle causes Nastasia Filipovna's death as much as Rogozhin's knife. Nastasya Filipovna is a strong character, but her role in the mushkin ragozhin binary is decidedly external, although her role in the novel is crucial to its narrative trajectory. On a structural level, this struggle is the key to understanding the idiot as an essentially Gothic text. In Gothic novels, the solution to a mystery may drive the narrative, but an age-old plot device constitutes the fundamental basis for the narrative's trajectory, and this kind of distilled down is the battle between good and evil. So common in world literature that it seems pretty obvious, the way the struggle plays out in The Idiot is uniquely Gothic. In the basic Gothic master plot, an essentially good but naive character begins to learn self-reliance, independence, and courage as she works to find the solution to the text's inherent mystery. An essentially evil character serves as a foil, not necessarily an inherent tendency, Evil in Gothic fiction can manifest as a lack of control over excessive passion or a predilection for extremes. The good character's well-intentioned actions prompt the evil character into ever more severe excesses. Similarly, the good character's interactions with the evil character are necessary for his own positive development. Without the evil character, the good character would remain the naive innocent, unsuited to life in the broader world. Eventually, the good character finds salvation and some moral authority justly punishes the evil character. The arbiter of punishment for the wicked sometimes appears in human form, as in Horace Walpole's 1764 Gothic novel, The Castle of Otranto, where the rightful heir of the castle meets out justice to a usurper. And sometimes divinely, as in William Beckford's 1786 novel, Vatek, where after many years of accumulated sins, Vatek is mysteriously pulled into hell while still alive. Despite what one might assume, the Gothic is not emphatically didactic. 
These novels do emphasize education, but more in the sense of a Bildungsroman, underscoring the virtues of broadening one's mind through experience and exploration, rather than morally teaching readers why it is a poor idea to have sex with one's sister or murder one's brother. Instead, the drama of behavioral extremes preoccupies Gothic fiction. Quote, sources of intense fascination, end quote, in the Gothic tradition, these behavioral extremes can be identified, according to Chloe Chard, quote, precisely by virtue of the expressions of horror and censure which are directed towards them, end quote. Gothic novels are typically divided by scholars into two schools, the school of terror and the school of horror, and the Gothic master plot can play out different ways in each. Kim Ian Machisu describes the difference between the two schools thus. Um, and this is a long quote, but I'm also going to um, include it on my slides as you'll see in just a minute. So um, it, it will appear, it's important, but long. Um, quote, terror seems to evoke by suggestion, by suspense. Horror displays in the hope of producing disgust. Terror veils a potentially ghastly unknown and tempts the reader to peer through, to pull up a corner. Horror marches readers through catacombs filled with violated nuns and the rotting corpses of infants with entombed lovers turned cannibal. Terror remains discreet and seeks a unity of tone. Horror has an appetite for sudden variation, for the blackly comic, for the grotesque, end quote. In the school of, oh, yeah. in the school of terror, the plot frequently echoes the basic plot of Anne Radcliffe's novels, in which a young naive heroine finds herself isolated from her friends and in the power of an older man. The young lady slowly comes to realize the dangers of her situation through a series of fearful discoveries. In the end, the entire truth is revealed, the heroine is rescued, and the villain is suitably punished. The School of Horror presents a second variation on the same master plot, placing more emphasis on the villain's spiral into ultimate evil. In this school, the positive character acts as a catalyst for the negative character's violence and unwittingly prompts increasingly excessive behavior. In this variation, the representative of good is often a victim of the hero's increasingly extreme violent behavior, as in Beckford's Botic, for example. More focused on the positive development of an individual, the School of Terror places its protagonist in a series of frightening situations that serve as tests. Sublime anxiety, the tension between what the protagonist most fears and most desires, and from which he tries repeatedly to break free, characterizes these works. On the other hand, the school of horror dwells on the unrestrained passion of an individual who aspires to a greater position than he should. The idiot effectively follows a positive character's development through the Radcliffe line, that is through the school of terror. Mushkin's traits are ideal for such a hero. He is humble, naive, trusting, loyal, and incapable of cruelty. When he feels anxious, Mushkin even retreats in his own imagination to a sublime alpine landscape, which features a gloomy ruined castle and towering snow-capped peaks. Um, and here's the quote. Yuri Corrigan has described Mushkin as, quote, a wounded individual who struggles to distinguish between a projective world populated with reflections of his own psyche and the actual world of people on the other, end quote. In this scheme, the imagined Swiss landscape that appears in this quote and appears in other quotes um, comforts Mushkin and becomes a safe space when reality and society become too dreadful to bear. In The Mysteries of Udolpho, uh, which is an Anne Radcliffe's most famous novel, wicked villains oppress Emily St. Ober, the heroine of the novel, seeking to corrupt and harm her. Like other Gothic heroines, she finds a moment of comfort in sublime landscapes um, like this one that provide interludes of mental relief in an otherwise fraught existence. Um, this moment on the slide occurs as she travels with her uncle, the villainous Count Montoni, to an unknown location. Emily may feel oppressed by her situation, but the landscape enables her mental release, just as we saw it lifts Mushkin's anxiety. The Gothic novel heroine finding solace in a sublime landscape is a common motif in the literature of terror, and Mushkin's parallel search for succor in the rem remembered landscape of his Swiss sojourn neatly fits into this pattern. Here we have another quote, Mushkin and landscape. Earlier, when discussing Switzerland with the Apontian sisters, Mushkin remembers how anxious he felt there at first, and how the landscape both provoked this anxiety and then resolved it. It was in those, oh, this is the quote. 
quote. Um, so in the faraway blue line that Mushkin sees, he's able to transcend his troubles in a moment of sublime revelation, although this moment pales in comparison to his brilliant epiphanic visions just before he falls into an epileptic fit. The landscape he describes closely echoes the landscape Emily traverses with her family. And here we see the same blue line, the melting blue tint seem to unite earth and sky. Hero and heroine share both sensibility and sense of the sublime in these passages. Mushkin's view results in a sublime vision in which his questions are resolved, his mysteries solved. All three, Mushkin, Emily, and her aunt react with fear. We understand Mushkin's unease in his observation of the terrible stillness, while Emily and her aunt both react with a shudder. Emily's fears, however, quote, were mingled with such admiration, astonishment, and awe as she had never experienced before, end quote, exposing the young heroine's ability to feel the working of the sublime. While Mushkin, uh, well, Emily rather, begins her adventures surrounded by family, she loses all early on. Similarly, compared to the other characters, Mushkin is strikingly isolated. His parents are unknown and his guardian has died. Thrust into the society of two interconnected families, the Apanchins and the Evolgans, upon his return to Rushka, Russia, Mushkin has only connections, only tenuous connections with them. He boards with the Evolgans, and he may be a distant relative of Madame Yapanchin, although it's not really clear. Nearly every other character has a blood or legal connection to one family or the other in the novel. Dostoevsky's first two notebooks for the novel chart a debate as to whether Mushkin should be illegitimate or legitimate. Dostoevsky vacillated on this point, ultimately eschewing the question in favor of the simple solution that there are no relations, um, with emphasis on relations, deliberately alienating his hero from the two families. Mishkin expresses fears of becoming trapped in this society, and Mishkin's fear of this entrapment is at odds with his attempts to fit in the Apanchins and Evolgan social circle. As an outsider, he has spent considerable time establishing himself as a relative of Madame Yupanchina and working to help the various members of the social circle. Why then does he feel such anxiety about assimilating? In Marilyn Butler's description of the Radcliffe heroine, she presents this isolation as an important feature. Quote, the Radcliffe heroine is isolated and surrounded by strangers, enemies, or equivocal friends. Her parents are dead, possibly dead, or not certainly known. The last an equally powerful, more suggestive indicator of her alienation, end quote. Um, Butler continues, at the nodal point or point in her story, the Radcliffe heroine comes to a building which may provide a seeming refuge by day, but becomes a threatening haunted maze by night. A mystery seems to hang over these chambers, which it is still perhaps my lot to develop, end quote. So that last bit was Butler quoting Radcliffe. Um, and what we see is, in the idiot, Rogozhin's house serves as this space. Um, and here we have a quote about um, the way that Mushkin perceives the house. The description of the house alerts us to its mysteries, if not to their solutions, which it is Mushkin's task to then discover. Mushkin visits Rogozhin's house in parts two and four. His first visit occurs just before he begins to experience epileptic fits again, before his circle of acquaintances in St. Petersburg begins to spiral out of control. The second visit concludes the novel. Mushkin feels excitement and dread approaching the house. His journey to its second floor, and here we have it described, um, where Rogozhin lives is no less fraught with mysteries and secrets. And this has been um, cut considerably to fit on the slide, but there are a lot of descriptions of um, massive rooms and this kind of like zigzagging architecture that is labyrinthine. The perilous and mysterious ascent through zigzagging hallways and, and up and down stairs that fit no architectural plan, as well as the strange encounter with Rogozhin at the end of it, mirrors the exploration of a castle in a gothic novel. As Butler notes, quote, always at midnight in fear of discovery by the other people of the house, in fear of ghosts and whatever else she may find. She, the Radcliffe heroine, unlocks hidden doorways, feels her way down dark passages and finds the equivocal keys to the past, a familiar looking portrait, a bloodstained dagger, a scroll of paper or a chest big enough to hold a human skeleton." End quote. Now, Mushkin um, is not exploring by himself. He's being led by a servant and being led by Rogozhin, but Rogozhin's rooms could have been taken directly from a Gothic castle. 
from the strange old furniture to the suspicious and gloomy portrait of his father hanging in its dusty frame. Although the faux marble and painted walls add a sense of modern artificiality to the scene, um, we do see in the room as well, the dagger and also the um, important portrait of a uh, painting of um, the dead Christ in the tomb by Hans Holbein. At the end of this passage, Mushkin remark remarks to Ragozhin, your house has the physiognomy of your whole family and your whole Ragozhin way of life. But ask me how I concluded that. I have nothing to explain it. It's raving nonsense, of course. I'm even anxious that it troubles me so. This reflection of a character and his family legacy in the form of a house is common in Gothic novels, stemming from the castle of Otranto and including all of the famous works by Anne Radcliffe, as well as Clara Reeves, the Old English Baron, which was the first Gothic novel translated into Russian and others. This is not to say that this technique is only used in the Gothic tradition, but its placement here, following Mushkin's ascent to Bogosian's chamber, signals Gothic narrative force. Building upon this initial exploration of the space, Mushkin's second visit to the house and discovery of Nastasia Filipovna's corpse in Rogozhin's study echoes Emily St. Ober's discovery of what lies behind the black veil in the mysteries of Vidolfo. Ostensibly, the Gothic villain character of the work, Rogozhin, not surprisingly, serves as the dark counterpart to Mushkin's holy good character. Rogozhin lives a life of extreme passions, committing infamous acts frequently because of his passion for Nastasia Filipovna. His actions become increasingly extreme and immoral as the novel continues. In the beginning, he steals from his father. He then beats Nastasia Filipovna and attempts to purchase her for money. Rogozhin swears eternal brotherhood with Mushkin, exchanges crosses with him, then attempts to murder him. After engaging in an orgy with Nastasia Filipovna, he chases her until she agrees to marry him, then following their marriage, murders her. In the end of the novel, Rogozhin is struck by delirium, then arrested, tried, and sent to Siberia for his crime. If we read Dostoevsky's Idiot as a Gothic text, the complex plot of the novel actually draws from both the school of terror and the school of horror, using both variants of the Gothic master plot simultaneously. Through the characters of Mishkin and Rogozhin, both the progress of the good character and the downward spiral of the bad character are captured in the novel. These two plot lines play off each other, informing the trajectories of each. Mushkin's presumptive mission to spread goodness through the example of active love is increasingly ineffective, while Rogozhin, with his countering obsessive passions, sets events in motion that lead to the moral downfall of other characters. In this sense, Dostoevsky's realist novel echoes a Gothic one. To a certain extent, the idiot fits this binary narrative model of a good Mushkin and an evil Rogozhin, but the novel proves considerably more complicated. At times, Christ like Mushkin seems like a stock character, endlessly good, patient, and self-sacrificing. There are moments, however, when he admits that the stress of such behavior is wearing on him, and certainly his eventual relapse into idiocy is not an expected fate for a virtuous positive character in either Gothic model. Additionally, Mushkin's behavior constantly underscores his tendency towards a lack of restraint. His inability to control his passion for self-sacrifice prompts other characters to make poor decisions. Rogozhin, on the other hand, who follows the classic Gothic pattern of spiraling into increasingly extreme behaviors, is a tightly self-controlled character elsewhere in the text. While on the surface, the idiot appears to fit well within the Gothic novel Masterplot's confines, Dostoevsky's realist characters explode the boundaries of Gothic stock characters. Famously, Dostoevsky set up the idiot as an experiment. A positively beautiful hero is placed in the contemporary Russian society, his concern, the redemption of man. Through his use of the Gothic, Dostoevsky is able to frame his great theological experiment, staging a theoretical war between good and evil. He uses the Gothic to highlight his hero's Christ-like outlook, compassion, and actions, but also to reveal the extent of Mushkin's failure. The Gothic mode offers the powerful rhetoric that Robin Foyer Miller describes, but also contains the possibility of the experiment's ideal outcome, a happy ending. For Dostoevsky, the ending of the novel was crucial. Um, he wrote in a December 1868 letter to Mykov, the ending will decide everything. The ending was the point on which the experiment's outcome and the novel's purpose and meaning rested. And here we come to part two, the Gothic trappings and the reader. While the idiot incorporates a Gothic master plot, 
The most apparent Gothic elements to readers are its Gothic trappings. These are what initially strike readers and convey the atmosphere of anxiety that permeates the novel. But they also add humor and irony. First, and perhaps most obviously, Dostoevsky constantly repeats lexemes that contribute to the generic atmosphere. So for example, um, he repeats the word strach, strachna over and over again. Um, secondly, and most provocatively, brief Gothic moments appear in the narrative's course. These moments appear so suddenly without context that they seem out of place or they're easily overlooked. Often they're at first humorous, but taken together, they inform the novel's broader atmosphere of anxiety. So here is one example of them. These are often little kind of throwaway moments that you wouldn't necessarily think too much about in the novel, right? So in the beginning of part three, Alexandra Yapanchina has a dream about a monk. Um, and we see this, uh, she saw a monk all alone in some dark room that she kept on being afraid to enter. Um, and it, it's humorous, of course, because the dream seems to be original, right? Um, but it, this is, of course, almost directly from a Gothic novel. Um, Alexandra's dream features a classic cliched Gothic scene that might have been lifted directly from the monk, Melmoth the Wanderer, any of a number of other works. A heroine fears to enter a monk's dark chamber. The dream is hardly original, although it may seem so to Alexandra's mother, who, we learn, prefers English romances to horrid novels. For Dostoevsky's readers, the derivative cliched nature of the dream would have been apparent. At first, the episode seems in keeping with Alexandra's previous dream, a humorous flight of fancy about poultry. However, the scene also serves to hint at a darker Gothic subtext. While the dream is ironically tongue in cheek, we wonder why a young innocent girl's subconscious is engaged with such a dark and implicitly, implicitly frightening subject. Even though the dream's content is funny, Alexandra's terror is real. Never mentioned again, this dream feels like an aberration. However, it prefigures the cannibalistic monks who feature in Lebedev's outlandish stories. These apocalyptic and cataclysmic tales evoke the Gothic again, although more in the sense of a humorous interlude meant to poke fun at a character. Lebedev begins by discussing the apocalyptic star Wormwood, but his manner of speaking lends an air of absurdity to the discussion. This sense of the absurd continues as he tells the story of an order of cannibalistic Catholic monks. In addition to cannibalism's, cannibalism's inherent sensationalism, the moral depravity of both Catholic monks and cannibals are well-known themes in Gothic fiction. Lebedev imbues them with humor in his story. Certainly, the story of a man eating 66 people, if true, represents such excessive transgressive behavior that it's difficult for a casual listener to process. Preceded by Lebedev's discussions of apocalyptic imagery and followed by one of Mushkin's recurring descriptions of ruined castles in the Alps, the tale's Gothic cloaking contributes to its comedic effect. Lebedev's tendency towards hyperbole shows him to be ridiculous as well. However, as Lebedev continues his speech, he begins to discuss the torments of the, medi the medieval justice system, arousing pity and indignation in his initially skeptical and merry audience. The sudden serious note at the end of this speech is at odds with Lebedev's earlier riotous tale of cannibalistic monks. While the fanaticism of the 12th century is far removed from the novel's present, Lebedev here, through his Gothic tale and subsequent speech, introduces the idea that medieval torments resonate more closely with the present day than one would think. Moreover, in linking Mushkin's and Ippolit's vague fears with this Gothic tale and one of the very real mysteries of the novel, namely what this binding element is and how it can be achieved, Lebedev sets the stage for Ippolit's tortured monologue to follow. This combination of comedy and terror creates a black humor that adds an edge to the narrative. This edge then easily mutates into Ippolit's dark bitterness apparent throughout his subsequent tale. In these episodes, Dostoevsky exploits the Gothic's comic parodic potential for readers, as well as its predilection for shock value. Alternating humorous ironic jibes at characters' originality or rhetorical inability with glimpses of baldly serious or genuinely terrifying moments creates a disorienting atmosphere in which unease creeps up on the reader, enabling an overwhelming sense of anxiety to permeate the text, engulfing both characters and reader. 
Robin Foyer Miller argues that Dostoevsky uses the Gothic narrative voice strategically, which also enables the novel's dialogic structure. This Gothic voice plays a significant role in the relationship between the novel's narrator and its reader, the target of Dostoevsky's powerful rhetoric. This link between reader and text was key for Dostoevsky, for whom the novel's importance lay not only in its idea, but more importantly, in that idea's reception by its intended audience. Malcolm Jones takes Miller's argument one step further, arguing that the Gothic narration in The Idiot plunges the reader into a Gothic mindset. He describes the experience of reading the novel as one of entrapment. I would argue that it even positions the reader as an active player in its action, where the reader feels entrapped. The narrator, in Jones's words, quote, provokes increasing anxiety in readers, end quote. The reader becomes mystified and confused as the text continues, until eventually the narrator, quote, reveals indirectly and by way of repeated hints that he knows his reader's guilty secret, end quote. Jones's language recalls Gothic novels, and we recall that one of their key features is a text's focus on mystery and its solution. In reading The Idiot, in Jones's view, the reader becomes implicit in this relationship, playing an active, if unconscious, role in the text. Jones suggests that this strategy results in greater reader investment in the novel, either because readers are lured into, quote, individual consciousness, end quote, which perpetuates the novel's realism, or because readers are able to connect and sympathize with the emotional underpinnings of the text. The reader's unease and the novel's anxious atmosphere unite, creating a viable mode in which Gothic conventions that should be cliched or parodic still carry a sensation of fear with them. Voyeuristic watching is one of the most frequent manifestations of anxiety in the text, and it's often represented as two eyes staring. The uncanny feeling discomforts Mushkin, Nastasia Filipovna, and others. This is an example of this. Um, in part two, for example, Mushkin feels that Agorjan's eyes on him at the train station. Mushkin here does not know if he's truly being watched. The feeling could be a manifestation of his own anxieties, or Ragozhin's could be, excuse me, or Ragozhin could be covertly observing Mushkin. Either way, the scene evokes an uncanny fear and an uncanny fear in Mushkin, described above as an unpleasant impression, and contributes to the underlying anxiety various characters feel throughout the novel. These eyes appear again in Nastasia Filipovna's Three Letters to Mushkin at the end of part two. And here we have a quote from one of her letters. Like Mushkin, Nastasia Filipovna feels Rogozhin's eyes upon her, even when she knows that he is not present. They provoke an uncanny feeling of fear, which she then associates with basic Gothic conventions, a gloomy dreary house and a dead body under the floorboards. Nastasi Filipovna's anxieties manifest themselves through these voyeuristic eyes. The cycle of anxiety and fear creates a sense that horrors lurk beneath society's surface facade, contributing again to the, Gothic, the novel's Gothic atmosphere. A third voyeuristic scene appears in part three, chapter five. Ippolite wakes up suddenly, pales, looks about in alarm, and the narrator notes that, quote, there was almost a look of horror on his face when he remembered everything and collected his thoughts. As Ippolite prepares to read to the assembled guests, he infects all with this fear, although the others cannot understand precisely why they are afraid. And this is their reaction. And you can see that there's uh, an a kind of extreme level of fear encapsulated in this scene, which doesn't necessarily um, map to what's happening in the novel, unless you read it as a Gothic novel with this structure. From this opening, um, we expect another scandal scene. The anxious anticipation of characters echoes the atmosphere before Nastasia Filipovna's name day party. There, however, the anxiety is merely social. Party guests are looking forward to a scandalous scene. Here, the anticipatory anxiety is genuinely terrifying to a degree out of proportion with the event, which is a young man doing a reading. Just as this fear begins again to wane and Ippolite wakes from the reverie, Rogozhin begins interacting with the company and once again stirs up these feelings of fear and a general aura of mystery. Here we have a quote. Ippolite's recognition of and reaction to Rogozhin as the man who was in his room late one night or who he imagined in his room late one night, it's not entirely clear, adds to this atmosphere.
Now, this reaction at the end is surprising, right? But Agosian does not wield thumb screws, thumb screws or a rack in this scene, but Ippolit reacts as though he's being tortured. We can understand Ippolit's reaction. His condemned state leaves him vulnerable to fear. In this scene, however, his reaction does cast Rogozhin as a villain, and we must wonder why. The image of Rogozhin watching the sleeping Ippolit from the shadows in the middle of the night should be alarming. Ippolit has until now been a peripheral character. Largely unexplored within the novel, this new link between the two adds a sinister undertone to their relationship, however, exposing a fundamental difference in authority. The sleeping state renders Ippolit at his most vulnerable. Rogozhin, awake and observing, could hurt or even kill the defenseless Ippolit. Secretly watching, after all, constitutes a typical Gothic tableau. It subtly incorporates multiple Gothic conventions, voyeurism, an authority willing to exploit its victim, the uncanny feeling of being watched, paranoia, and imprisonment. By building up fearful anxiety, Dostoevsky creates a Gothic Petersburg. The fine gentlemen and ladies who inhabit the fair city and its summer neighborhood in Pavlovsk are, on the surface, to be living lives taken from society tales. Um, mothers seek to marry off their daughters. The business of official life engages the heads of family. Connections are made and nearly all the action occurs through conversation in carefully staged social settings. Behind this veneer, however, these same fine ladies and gentlemen are not what they appear to be. Guardians seduce wards. Daughters dream about monks and don't really know why. Gentlemen die and the death is not gentle but agonizing and sometimes violent. And underlying all of this, a basic anxiety, the cause of which remains unknown, drives society. Going back to where we started, back with this amazing bat image, um, when General Yapanchin says, yes, yes, but I'm afraid after all, I don't understand what of, but I'm afraid. It's as though there's something darting about in the air like a bat. Some trouble is hovering and I'm afraid, afraid. He is articulating the fear that drives the narrative and the reader's interaction within the novel. The characters are aware on some level of this fear. Society's veneer cracks for them at times, and the Gothic foundation shows through in the manifestations of their anxiety, in the hovering bats and voyeuristic eyes, the creeping monsters and strange monks, the cannibals and apocalyptic stars, and the corpses under the floorboard, all of which they imagine throughout the course of the novel. So what do we make of all of this? Despite the novel's gothic trappings, ultimately, Mushkin's inability to develop as a character causes the abrupt and ignominious end of the gothic masterplot's positive trajectory. Vladimir Zakharov observes that, quote, the idea of Mushkin persists as the main concept, end quote, in The Idiot, while later no novels develop multiple ideologies conveyed through multiple characters. Perhaps then, the gothic masterplot's denouement is a symptom of the narrative experiment with its reliance on one character. Elizabeth Dalton presents a terrifying reading in this vein, quote, the character of Mushkin himself is somehow an absence or negation. His personality is defined in large part by what he does not do, by what he is not, and thus not only evokes a vision of its opposite, a shadowy double embodying all that is missing, and yet somehow contained by its absence in Mushkin, but also suggests in him a sort of gulf or abyss, the possibility of a terrifying fall into a negative realm of being where the very forms of personality might be annihilated, end quote. Dalton's psychoanalytical reading brings into question Dostoevsky's claim to have created a positively good man. Bruce French argues that Mushkin's isolation from a predictable narrative trajectory results in his inherent goodness. Quote, it is the prince's lack of storiness made possible by his dialogical relationship with the world that is fundamental in his being able to live fully, morally, and religiously, end quote. In this chapter's, re in this talk's Gothic reading of the idiot, Mushkin's narrative trajectory is unique in that it does not continue to its conventionally predicted conclusion as Rogozhin's does. In French's terminology, it defies its own storiness. However, the question remains, if Mushkin is wholly good, why is he unable to effect positive change? Instead, Mushkin acts blindly without considering the destructive consequences of his actions. As Dalton observes, quote, his gentle passage through the lives of the other characters has laid waste to them with a kind of apocalyptic destructiveness, end quote. According to Dostoevsky's experiment, the tension and inadvertent destruction unleashed by Mushkin's innocence, humility, and truthfulness expose both the insufficiency of his idealism and society's greater spiritual emptiness in its inability to accommodate him. 
perhaps Dostoevsky means that Mushkin's inner beauty as a man without sin, with a naive childlike outlook and compassionate love for all, will save the world by standing as an example for all. However, Mushkin fails to save even one of the doomed characters he encounters in Petersburg and Pavlovsk, including himself. Can beauty save the world? In Gothic novels, it can. Emily St. Ober, Radcliffe's heroine, is a truly beautiful person. She is steady, compassionate, kind, morally decent, and courageous. She faces a slew of fearsome trials as she attempts to extricate herself from the situation at Udolpho, and she succeeds, emerging as a better, more mature person for it. Her courage and reason shine in the face of all who seek to destroy her, and the end of the novel finds her morally whole living out her days in peace and tranquility with her loved ones, the evil foes vanquished and her ancestral estate saved. This is one reason this genre works especially well as a backdrop for Dostoevsky's positively beautiful man. The desired outcome is at least possible within the Gothic's realms, even though beauty does not save the world in The Idiot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so as and as you were you were talking, a small pale face looked out at me through the uh, through the crack in my door. So I had my own gothic experience. <laughs> um, but um, so so now um, uh, Professor Bowers is going to take questions. So um, people should feel free either to post their questions um, in the chat, and I can read them out to her. If you um, but if you would rather, uh, you're also welcome to um, to ask a question uh, by or just put a cue in the chat, and I'll call on you to um, to ask your own question. Um, anybody want to start? Yeah, uh, Taras. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Uh, thank you for um, a wonderful uh, talk. Um, I enjoyed your um, sort of outline and contrast between terror and horror, mm -hmm. and it uh, remind me, re reminded me to to some degree uh, Svetan Todorov's um, play with Uncanny, mm -hmm. uh, marvelous and the oscillation between the two that creates the fantastic. Mm -hmm. and I was wondering if something like that could be done with terror and horror in which two categories get, uh, th there could be some kind of vacillation between the two, between something that is overt and grotesque and disgusting and something that is uncanny, that is, um, terrifying in a more subtle way, more disguised way. Uh, and maybe it could even fit with um, our usual um, sort of workshop of uh, Bakhtin's dialogue or um, uh, dialogism or, or polyphony in novels where various versions, voices produce their own versions of reality which we then as reader are compelled to decipher. So that's one kind of direction of my question. The, the, the second one is, uh, <laughs> as I started thinking, is there any novel of Dostoevsky that is not um, gothic in some ways? It's, and I'm kind of a little bit at a loss. Yeah, the answer is they no. They all are. <laughs> gothic, they're super gothic. Uh, all of Dostoevsky's novels are super gothic. Um, yeah, so in regarding your first question, thank you for that. Um, so I should say in Gothic studies scholarship, these categories of um, the school of terror, the school of horror are very much um, sort of prescribed by people who are observing what's happening in the genre. And they have been for several hundred years. So like at the time when Anne Radcliffe and Matthew Lewis were writing, critics were already naming what they were doing, the school of terror and the school of horror, and they themselves kind of embraced these labels. So um, Anne Radcliffe, for example, herself wrote um, criticism where she talked about the school of terror and the school of horror. Um, Walter Scott was also writing about the differences between the school of terror and the school of horror. And because these people were the practitioners of this originally, that has really stuck in Gothic studies. However, I really do think that it, I mean, not everyone writing Gothic novels is particularly laying themselves out to be in the style of Radcliffe or in the style of 
Lewis. And so I think Merge and coming up with kind of hybrid categories in the style of Bakhtin's kind of dialogic um, theories, um, and certainly in the style of Todorov's way of looking at the fantastic, which is of course related, um, really would work very well. Um, at this, because I'm trying to write um, my book grounded in Gothic theory, like the, the kind of Gothic, the development of Gothic studies, um, I have not done that very much, but certainly there's space for that. Um, and Malcolm Jones actually in his, um, the book that I showed the cover of, the Dostoevsky after Bakhtin book, he theorizes this out a little bit, um, mm -hmm. not exactly in terms of Gothic, but in terms of Gothic's relation to the fantastic. I hope that answers your question. Um, but it's, it's certainly really interesting to think about. And I think there's a lot more work to be done in this area. Okay. I'm gonna interject here and there's two questions in the chat. So I'm yeah. gonna ask them. So the first one is from Petra Bielitsa and she says, um, would you be kind enough to comment briefly also on demons from this perspective on Biese? And then the other one is from Andrew McMillan, and he says, I would suggest there are elements of the Gothic in all Dostoevsky's works, but why should the idiot seem to have so much more than others? Okay, these are good questions and they're kind of related too. So thank you for that. Um, the first thing is, uh, so I have um, written about the Gothic corpse in The Idiot um, and the way that the Gothic corpse kind of informs and drives the fear of the novel. And the Gothic corpse, I, I always end up talking about corpses in my Q&A, the Gothic corpse really unites these two questions. Um, so in Demons, almost all of the Gothic moments occur around a corpse in some way. So it's either the corpses um, that are found in burned out houses, the corpse that they're trying to bury, the corpse of the suicide, right? Um, so all of these moments, or when, when someone is about to commit suicide and he begins to um, take on the kind of, this Gothic atmosphere imbues the room and he almost appears as a corpse before his death. All of these, these kind of moments in demons are around this idea of a corpse. Now Dostoevsky is writing demons right after the idiot. And in the idiot, um, there is a very famous corpse that um, inspired a lot of the fear of the novel. And this is um, the dead Christ in the tomb, Hans Holbein's painting. And this is maybe the first idiot talk I've ever given that doesn't have a slide of the dead Christ in the tomb in it. So that's a refreshing change for everyone, including um, shout out to my students in the audience who've seen the dead Christ in the tomb a lot this semester. But um, the dead Christ in the tomb is a painting that for Dostoevsky encapsulated a kind of existential, um, for lack of a better word, a kind of crisis of faith, right? Um, and the terror of that crisis of faith is the terror that makes the idiot, I would argue, which is Dostoevsky's most autobiographical novel, the novel where he's really dealing with um, the ramifications of his mock execution, um, his closeness to death, the feeling that he wasn't entirely convicted in what would happen afterwards, especially with the conversation that he has with Pieshnev, um at the mock execution where he says, to Pieshnev, who's like standing next to him. Um, oh, soon we'll be there with the bright light and um, the beautiful sunshine. And Pieshnev says, or we'll just be dust. And this sends Dostoevsky spiraling into this kind of crisis, right? Um, the fear inherent in that crisis is what drives the narrative of the idiot. So that's why I would argue that the idiot is Dostoevsky's most Gothic novel. Because the Gothic enables Dostoevsky to communicate that fear to the reader in a realist way. So the, the reader, using these gothic kind of narrative devices begins to feel the fear, the anxiety as well, in a way that um, is present in other Dostoevsky novels, but not to the same degree. Thank you. Um, anybody else have a question? So I, I'm going to ask my question then. Um, so you, um, you talk about sort of gothic Petersburg. And quite a lot of what you were talking about is also kind of present in the Petersburg text, um, mm -hmm. at least as far back as um, as Pushkin, right? Um, and so sort of a lot of the sort of um, all is not as it seems, right? So mm -hmm. Nevsky Prospect, right? That the beautiful woman turns out to be, a, in fact, a prostitute, right? Mm -hmm. Or a sex worker, rather. And then sort of obviously also... Um, <laughs> 
um, se several Pushkinian into text as well. So I was wondering sort of um, if you could talk a little bit about sort of the lead up to Dostoevsky in terms of the uh, Russian uh, influence uh, of the influence of Gothic um, texts on Russian literature. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I should say is that, and this is absent from a lot of histories of Russian literature that you may be reading, um, the Gothic was very influential. So in the early 19th century, late 18th century, everybody was reading this. A lot of people were writing this. Um, and th this was what was selling books. Um, but because it is an imported genre, uh, because it comes from the West, and because there aren't a lot of, so like there's Karamzin's, um, Astrov Bornholm, right? Um, the island of Bornholm. And there's a couple of other texts that are kind of homegrown and shown up as examples of this. But for the most part, these are seen as being pretty derivative from other Gothic texts that are being published. Um, and because uh, you have this um, homegrown kind of Gothic fantastic that takes its cues from um, A.T.A. Hoffmann and the German uh, Gothic Romantic writers, um, which is the line of like Pushkin's Queen of Spades, Gogol's The Overcoat, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you don't really have a lot of concentration in the terms of the history of Russian literature on the importance of the Gothic. But if you consider that everybody is reading the Gothic um, novels, you will see that it is much more influential than we would otherwise think. So um, there are a lot of, now people are kind of discovered, now that people are taking more of an interest in the Gothic, um, it's being discovered that there are um, a number of overlooked stories that were being published. Um, you have people, of course, they're not just reading in Russian, they're reading in French, they're reading in English, they're reading in German, and they're reading Gothic novels in French, English, and German. Um, you also will notice that um, in a lot of later novels, so like, for example, um, Anne Radcliffe's Mysteries of Udolpho was amazingly influential to the point that even decades after it stopped being published in Russia, um, it's still coming up in different Russian novels. So Bazarov, for example, makes a Mysteries of Udolpho joke in Fathers and Sons. Um, Mysteries of Udolpho is, appears in the courtroom scene in the Brothers Karamazov as a kind of like throwaway joke. And the idea there is that all of Dostoevsky's readers in 1880 are gonna get the Anne Radcliffe joke. Like that's why he puts it there. Um, and at the point when you're reading public is able to get a joke, this has really saturated in, right? Um, and even up to like Boon and Chekhov are all engaging with these same Gothic tropes. So it's, it's really wildly influential. That being said, the Petersburg setting particularly lends itself um, precisely because of its um, history of both uh, this kind of shiny state facade and then um, the kind of underbelly of the city where truth kind of lurks, right? Um, that kind of idea behind the Petersburg text um, the idea of, uh, and also Petersburg itself lends itself to a Gothic atmosphere, right? Because you have this mist, you have this kind of yellow flickering gaslight. Um, and so there, there are moments when you think like, yes, the devil might appear lighting the lamps on Nevsky Prospect. Yes, the ghost of Akaki Akakievich um, might pop up and be stealing people's overcoats, right? Um, and so in that sense, the Petersburg text becomes... Um, it takes in the Gothic, although most people have not recognized it as such. I should also say that I'm talking a lot about this, um, but I will say one more thing, which is that, um, so we expect Gothic Petersburg in Dostoevsky texts. Uh, we see that in, as I was describing, Rogozhin's house being described as a labyrinthine kind of Gothic space. And this is true in a lot of Dostoevsky's texts. So in Hazyaika, for example, um, her building is described as this Gothic space. In Nyatushka Nizvanova, there's a lot of Gothic stairwells where Nyatushka spends time hiding and eavesdropping. Um, there's like a blood red house that kind of like has a sinister view because of the, the lights behind its curtains in Nyatushka. There's a lot of these kind of scenes, right? And certainly, of course, um, in Tvainik. But um, where you don't expect to see it is in physiological writing, where um, Gothic, so physiological writers who are writing what we consider to be kind of boring stuff, although I find it interesting, um, use Gothic narrative devices to make their um, physiological pieces more impactful, um, which I find really interesting. And they're able to do it precisely because they're playing on these tropes of the Petersburg text. 
Thank you. Um, so now um, Barnabas, um, I think, has a question. Um, he posted a queue. Uh, hello, hey, yes. uh, hello. 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 Uh, thank you for your talk, Dr. Powers. Um, my question really is to know a little bit more about how you see Mushkin within his active role within the Gothic, no Gothic novel, in that his role as a Gothic storyteller, for example, when we see his final um, narrative on the condemned man, the mm -hmm. picture that he gives at the end is sort of quintessentially Gothic in that we have a man with a face white as paper and blue lips and kissing a cross, though he doesn't really know that it's a cross that he's kissing. And we have the mist behind him and he says, you know, the, the head and the cross is all that you should know and that is useful. Mm -hmm. And that strikes me as very Gothic, but not particularly you know, that sense of terror and horror seems to be missing, at least the reception that his story has after it. And I'm, I'm wondering, therefore, how you see his role as a Gothic storyteller within the novel, and that really, is he passive in the way that some people see his actions as what he doesn't do, or does he indeed contribute to that Gothic setting along with Rogozhin? So what what happens in my research, and this this did not appear in the, I have a lot of material on the idiot, much of which did mm -hmm. not appear in this talk. Um, but one of the things that actually happens in the end of the novel is Dostoevsky recreates the black veil scene from Anne Radcliffe's Mysteries of Udolpho. And this is mm -hmm. the scene where Mushkin and Ragojin go up to um, Ragojin's room at the very end and they draw back the curtain and Nastasia Filipovna is revealed to be um, there. Now, before this scene, um, there is a scene that mirrors Emily from Mysteries of Udolpho's kind of climb through the castle of Udolpho before she gets to the Black Veil, where she's opening doors and kind of feeling this anticipation. And the person who enacts the scene is Mushkin. And what's interesting about this is that, so there's, there's um, the moment when Nastasia Filipovna um, at her wedding appears at her, on the wedding day with Mushkin, right before she runs off with Rogozhin, she appears pale white with blue lips and kind of like trembling. She, she's described almost as a corpse. She has sunken cheeks um, and she kind of falls forward as though she doesn't really have her own agency. The person she falls forward into is Mushkin. And after this moment, Mushkin takes on the role of the Gothic novel heroine if you map it to the Gothic master plot in the text. So I'm not sure how good a Gothic storyteller Mushkin is, but as a Gothic character, Mushkin um, is quintessential. Like he, he takes up the burden when Nastasia Filipovna loses agency in the text. And I, I, I still need to puzzle out a little bit what the meaning of this is, but um, I think it's really interesting. And if you consider everyone in the novel as being different storytellers, right? Um, mm -hmm. They're all telling gothic -y stories. I'm not sure that Mushkin's stories are more Gothic than other people. Some of some people tell substantially more Gothic stories than Mushkin, certainly. Um, but I think that if you look at where Mushkin ends up in the text, he becomes the most Gothic character of all. Hmm. Thank you. Hmm? It's, it's interesting also to compare with um, his use of other genres, for instance, in, in the Brothers Karamazov, right? Mm -hmm. Where there's also this interesting slippage between for instance, Alyosha as kind of hagiographic, as hagiographer, right? But also as hagiographic hero, right? As being yeah, sort absolutely. of protagonist, but also writer of that text. And that Dostoevsky often seems to slip between one and the other with regard to his protagonist, right? Whether they're an actor or a, a character or, or an mm -hmm. author, right? In this sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, now Donna has a question. Yes, thank you for a fascinating, wonderful talk, Catherine. And uh, I, I uh, a lot of the questions that have already been asked were my questions as well. But I, I guess I was also like Kate, thinking about the relationship between Mishkin and Alyosha, and just wanted to ask the question: Does Mishkin le learn anything? I am so. Mushkin doesn't seem to end up in a different place than where he started at the beginning, right? So mm -hmm. at the beginning, we see him having these, um, we see him having a fit and he, it's the same trajectory. So he has the moment of epiphanic kind of vision and then he falls into the seizure. 
at the end, he has the same experience. He has the moment of epiphanic vision. And during that moment of vision, when he's talking, this is when he describes, you know, the beauty he sees in the society. He, he has really his most profound speech where he really articulates the philosophy that he's been trying to put forward. But then he falls into the seizure and the experience, like the visceral horror of that seizure on everyone in the company eliminates, kind of like cancels out everything that he was saying, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, I think that he he becomes he gets to the point where he's able to articulate better what he's saying, but he's not necessarily able to communicate it. Mm -hmm. Because and, he and, and is this is this Dostoevsky's intention, Katya? I don't know. I mean, who knows what Dostoevsky's? Intention? I, I'm just asking because uh, because the issue of actually describing a perfectly good human being, uh, there's a problem of boredom and right and and um so i see how the horror and the and the and the absolute goodness mix together to create something interesting mm -hmm. but well, does he keep trying is he is is he still so when you get to alyosha alyosha does learn something right mm -hmm. alyosha even has moments of of not evil but uh he's he he begins to see more uh, psychologically uh, uh, complex. Well, if you think about Dostoevsky's, the kind of philosophy of universal brotherhood that develops across his books, right? Mm -hmm. um, in The Idiots, he puts forward through Ippolit, which is also a kind of um, in imperfect damaged way of putting forward his message, right? Because Ippolit is also, he's able to come to this, this vision precisely because he's condemned by his terminal diagnosis, right? Um, so Ippolit puts forward this idea of the small seeds where the seeds grow um, and everyone has these kindnesses that they're doing to everyone else. And eventually this takes on these ramifications. This is how you can live afterwards. But it's only in the Brothers Karamazov where this idea uh, becomes a collective vision for a way of transforming the world. So I think part of the problem in The Idiot is that um, Dostoevsky realizes as the novel goes on that the individual cannot affect universal change for everyone, right? So the individual forced into this, uh, he, he will, he's doomed to failure um, and Mishkin, hmm. uh, Mishkin can't help himself, right? Um, the way that Mishkin is built, he has to embrace Ragozhin in the end. Um, but in embracing Ragozhin, he also um, kind of crushes the idea of building anything better. Whereas in the Brothers Karamazov, Alyosha is able to start the seeds of building up the universal brotherhood precisely because he's not operating alone because Dostoevsky's philosophy is allowing him to operate in a um, more communal way than with Mushkin. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you think it has, uh, just one last, I'm just following up my own thoughts. Do you think it has anything to do with Mushkin coming from the West, whereas Alyosha is, is, uh, is Russian? It might, it might. Um, we know that Dostoevsky was writing the idiot from Switzerland, right? Mm -hmm. So that might also be partly why Mushkin is coming from the West. But I think if you look at Dostoevsky's notebooks, for the idiot, it's important for him in structuring the character that Mushkin comes from somewhere else, right? That he's a foreigner that gets dropped in. Um, and that that becomes an important plot point because Dostoevsky at the point of the idiot doesn't see this developing organically in Russia. He wants to see if, if he's able to affect change and that's the experiment, right? Um, and for Alyosha to be homegrown, so to speak, right? Yes, he comes from another community and he's kind of dropped back into uh, the community where the Karamazovs are living, which the name of which is escaping me. Um, but he's um, he's dropped in there, but he's able to um, forge connections, right? Uh, whereas Mushkin is not able to do that. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, it's yeah. Thank you very much. It's a, it's, it's just just about. curious about yeah. all these things. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else have a question? Oh, Maisie. Maisie has a question. Hi, Professor. Hi, Maisie. Hi, thanks for the enlightening lecture. Um, my question is, uh, 
What do you think the most gothic moment is in The Idiot? And is it the end at the death of Nastasia Filipovna? Um, or is it something in the buildup perhaps to that? Um, and then my other question is, is The Idiot his most gothic novel? Uh, thanks. So I would argue that The Idiot is Dostoevsky's most gothic novel. And I think the most gothic moment in The Idiot, although you can certainly, like you can map Anne Radcliffe to the end scene, as I mentioned, um, the most gothic moment is the quote that I showed where Nastasia Filipovna imagines, um, like she imagines Rogozhin's eyes staring at her and then she imagines her own death in, in the terms of like, she kind of foreshadows her own death um, in the, in the vision of the victim of the murderer wrapped in oilcloth under the floorboards, right? That, that is pretty gothic. Um, and the, it involves like a buried secret. It involves like the, the foreshadowing, the voyeurism, like all of it is there and all wrapped in, up in this kind of um, frightful anxiety. And when the reader gets hit with that, the, the reader should be feeling a lot of anxious foreboding, right? Um, I, I, that, that for me is the most gothic moment. Mm -hmm. um, I have another question I'm going to ask you, um, which is, um, so I was just wondering about the, um, the cinematic adaptations of The Idiot and the extent to which um, those are um, also following in these footsteps, right? The, I was thinking about Kurosawa's The Idiot, right? Um, mm -hmm. But also the, 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 I guess the Russian version from about uh, 10 or 15 years ago as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering to what extent do you think that these kind of cinematic adaptations um, are also kind of bor borrowings from some of the sort of affect of the novel itself? What I find, and I haven't seen every cinematic adaptation of The Idiot, um, although I have seen a fair number of them. Uh, so just full disclosure there. But um, the ones that I have seen do tend to pick up on the atmosphere and really play up the atmosphere. Um, the 2004 one, it's 2004, 2006, yeah. the Russian miniseries one. Yeah. Um, that one definitely plays with this more later on. Like it, it tries to be kind of a straight costume drama adaptation and then weird stuff starts happening. Um, certainly Kurosawa picks up on this. Uh, my favorite adaptation of The Idiot, for those of you who enjoy watching um, film adaptations of The Idiot, is the Estonian um, version from 2011, um, which is amazing. So the whole thing is filmed in a single Gothic church and they use different parts of the church for different parts of it. And it really evokes then this kind of atmosphere of just terror. Um, and it, it picks up on a lot of the, it doesn't necessarily follow the plot perfectly, but it picks up on precisely the feelings that you get when you're reading the novel. And it really plays with the ideas of anxiety and fear that come out of the novel. Um, so I find it really affecting. And uh, Zdenka has a question. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for that very interesting uh, talk. And so I just wanted to ask a question in which I try to make a c connection with something that I've been somewhat obsessed about for a long time. Um, so, uh, and this is kind of going back to your previous couple of comments ago, where you mentioned the uh, physiological or the the way that the physiology uh, writers uh, utilized uh, gothic qualities. And so in uh, Roman Jakobson's uh, article on realism, he mm -hmm. quotes uh, Dostoevsky at one point saying that exaggeration in art is unavoidable. And mm -hmm. uh, in order to show an object, it's necessary to deform the shape it used to have. And so I, I'm wondering with this quote kind of in mind, uh, um, how uh, the Gothic elements that, that you identify, uh, how they relate to, to realism. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, just I'd be interested to hear about that. Thank you. So my argument about Dostoevsky's realism is pretty much grounded in the Gothic novel, um, mm -hmm. which is my own obsession. and. Um, so there is a moment in The Idiot where um, Ippolit is talking and he says, well, how do you describe an image that is not an image, right? How do you describe a form that has no form? 
Um, and this, I think for Dostoevsky is what, th this is kind of like um, the cornerstone of his realist project, right? So mm -hmm. it's all well and good to describe like a tree or something that's easy to see, but how do you describe anxiety? Right? How do you describe the existential dread that you feel looking at the portrait of Christ in the tomb? Um, and trying to communicate that feeling, right, that affect, that is part of what Dostoevsky is trying to accomplish in his realist project. Because the dead Christ, it always comes back to the dead Christ in the tomb. The dead Christ in the tomb is just a painting of a guy on a slab without that existential fear, right? And if you can't communicate that, and like, I mean, in the 19th century, it's not like you could embed like a full color portrait of the dead Christ in the tomb in your novel. If you can't, communicate that fear, then what's the point? And you have to do it through narrative devices and the narrative devices have to be exaggerated enough for the reader to start feeling these things. And that's where Dostoevsky's realism comes from. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else have any questions? May I throw in another question, Kate? Sure. Uh, think, thinking about film, uh, filmic versions of The Idiot, and I have not seen any, are they scarier? Yeah, the one. What? Are they are they more frightening? Um, they can be. Mm -hmm. The Estonian one is is a trip. I highly recommend it to everyone. <laughs> it's hard <laughs> to find. If you like being frightened. <laughs> well, it it's not really frightening. And if you haven't read the novel, it doesn't make any sense. That's the other uh -huh. thing about it. But um it, it mm -hmm. is it's pretty wild. Um, and in terms of conveying, just like conveying feeling, I'm not sure fear is the right word, but conveying feelings of anxiety, like a kind of low key dread, it's for sure there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because um, Dostoevsky has to, he wants, people are drawn by fear, but also they're afraid of fear. So there has to be some kind of balance. Yeah. Which is probably easier to achieve in written, it's, it's written form than it is in visuals. Yeah, exactly. Well, it could be it could be easy to achieve in visuals, but Dostoevsky is not working with visuals. No, that's right. I'm talking about the filmic versus oh, right. the yeah versus the novel. So my, my, I, yeah, just to I, say that my granddaughter, my seven year old granddaughter, says that she's reading Harry Potter, and she says that she's she likes to read scary things. It's better than watching them because they're too scary when you watch them. So that's yeah. an interesting. Yeah, although my son has the opposite. He, he can deal with watching scary things, but he can't deal with reading them. Interesting. So. <laughs> huh. so, Very interesting. Yes. Anybody have any other questions? No. Nope. Okay, then I think we might we might finish here. I think we've had lots of good discussion. Mm -hmm. And oh, uh, Alison says, uh, watching things is scarier in the moment, but reading sticks with you. Yes, <laughs> entirely agree with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, so yeah, well, thank you ever so much. Um, this was great. Um, thanks all, thank you all for coming. Um, <laughs> And um, yeah, and hopefully we will see you all soon in, in other various different kinds of contexts. Um, thank you all. It was a pleasure. Um, and thank you, Kate and Donna and Maxine for inviting me. Thank okay. you. It's, it's mm -hmm. nice to get, a, to, get, get, to get back to the reason we got into this business instead of all the things we're doing. For sure. Instead. Yeah. 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 Okay. So we'll finish there. I have a lot of people writing me thank you in the chat, but I can't type fast enough to reply to everyone. <laughs> so thank you, everyone who is uh, writing me in the chat. Okay, great. Bye, everybody. Yay. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my slides. There we go.